Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this session of Financial Planning Day on Saving for College. This session is presented by the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment and our Kindergarten to College program. My name is Nicole Agbayani. I'm the director of the Office of Financial Empowerment, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Mohan Kanungo, who is the program manager for the City's Kindergarten to College, or k to c program. A huge thank you to our hosts today from the Financial Planning Association and the San Francisco Public Library. We really appreciate all the work you've done to pull this fantastic day together for us. Um, before we get started, I also wanted to share a quick housekeeping note. We are recording this session and we will make the recording and the slides available to everyone after the event today. All right, so taking a quick look at our agenda, we're going to start off with a brief introduction to the Office of Financial Empowerment and our programs. We'll spend the bulk of our time talking about our kindergarten to college program, how it works, and what some of the benefits are of saving for college with K2C. And we'll share some related resources at the bottom half of the presentation around um, some programs, can, including CalKids, some student debt relief, and a bit about financial coaching. And then, we'll, of course, we'll have time at the end for questions. All right, so first off, just to briefly introduce San Francisco's Office of Financial Empowerment. We are a small but mighty team that is housed under the umbrella of the Office of our elected treasurer, Jose Cisneros. Our mission is to support the economic security and mobility of all San Franciscans. And we spend a lot of our energy focusing on lower income folks in the city and in particular on programs and initiatives to support low income families. We've been doing this work since 2004 here in the city. And fast forwarding to today, you can see on the slide here some of our flagship programs. Um, we'll spend most of our time today talking about kindergarten to college, um, but we also have Smart Money Coaching, which offers free financial coaching to anyone who lives, works, or receives services in San Francisco. Our Bank on San Francisco program provides access to safe and affordable bank accounts for folks in the city who are unbanked or underbanked. And we also run a number of pilots and initiatives out of our office that aren't necessarily full-fledged programs. Um, so for example, we've done a lot of work to support the city's guaranteed income pilots since the start of the pandemic. And we've recently also been doing a lot around student debt relief for San Franciscans. Uh, so I'll be back a little later in the presentation to talk more about some of this. Um, but for now, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Mohan to introduce himself while I tee up a short video for you all. Hi everyone, my name is Mohan Kanungo and I'm the Kindergarten to College Program Manager. I've been with the City and County of San Francisco's Office of the Treasurer for just about two years. I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about a college savings initiative that I think is really fantastic um, for any K to 12th grade student here in the San Francisco Unified School District. But if you don't have a student in the district, we'll be sure to tell you about some initiatives here at the state level just launched um, called CalKids and what's also known as 529 ScholarShare. So <clears throat> in just a moment, we'll play a short video to give you uh, a sense of what um, k to c is all about, kindergarten to college, and we'll be sure to take time for your questions as we go through this. All right, ready for the video? In 2011, we launched the Kindergarten to College program to open up college savings accounts for all the kids in our public school district. Yo me siento feliz de saber que tengo guardado un poquito para mis hijos. We actually offer cash incentives. If you make a deposit, we'll put even more money into your college savings account. Tenemos la posibilidad de tener el doble de eso poquito que nosotros ahorramos. Saving makes me think more about college. When I grow up, I want to be a veterinarian. Awesome. Um, so we'll overview next um, what k to c is. Uh, Kindergarten to College is part of the Office of the San Francisco Treasurer, and we launched um, over 10 years ago uh, in partnership with the San Francisco Unified School District. And what we do is we open a savings account for every student, um, kindergarten to 12th grade, and we actually seed that savings account with $50. And we offer awards and incentives that encourage families to grow their college savings over time. 
I'll go to the next slide. And part of the premise of this program is really based on research that shows that just by having a savings account dedicated to college savings in a child's name can increase the likelihood of them going to college and also being more likely to graduate from college. And these differences are really pronounced, especially for lower income families. It helps in many ways to facilitate that college going mindset when there's even a small amount of money, even as little as $500, that really helps spark that conversation and makes it known for a student that we believe in your future. And so with city and county being the one that actually opens these accounts automatically for students and seed it with $50, we're saying to all of our students that you have a future we're saving for. And we'll go to the next slide. So to date, um, in terms of our impact, we've really grown this program since our launch, and we have um, over 49,000 accounts. Um, about 23% or about one in four of those participants have actually contributed their own money, meaning they've deposited money into this account. And the, the total amount saved is $11 million. That includes both contributions, personal of families and students, as well as money that we've matched or we've seeded initially. Um, what I feel particularly uh, proud of is that two thirds of that money is actually participants money. Um, and a third of that is coming from, go to the next slide. So some key features of the kindergarten to college account is that there's absolutely no fees. There's no minimum deposit, no uh, monthly maintenance charge, nothing of that sort. Um, part of the design of the program intentionally was that it would have no impact on public benefits. So in fact, we don't collect a social security number or ITIN number, which is an individual tax ID number. Um, we open these accounts automatically for students. And so it's not necessary to declare this as an asset on applications for public benefits. Um, we offer a number of deposit channels, um, four of them specifically. So you can go into a local city bank branch to make a deposit, say with cash or with a check. Um, we actually have uh, deposit days sometimes at city bank branches that allow students to actually go in and practice um, putting in money into their own account. So uh, at a city bank branch, it's one day. Um, be paid oops where you can check, drop it in the mail, just write your student's um, account number on the back and um, it gets routed and um, then deposited into the account. You can sign up for bill pay through your bank. Um, so we have some instructions on how to select kindergarten to college as the recipient um, and your bank will either you know, complete that payment electronically or send a check and you can sign that on a one-off or recurring basis. Um, and finally, if if you have um, any payment you receive um, electronically automated for direct deposit to have some of those funds automatically deposited in, into, the, into that child savings account. These funds as well are dedicated for college. So it's um, restricted in that you can't withdraw the funds unless there's a financial emergency um, or hardship in which which case we can um, give you the money back, but otherwise the money is going to stay there specifically for college to, to make deposits and engage with the account. Um, and when that student graduates, we um, distribute the funds and we're super excited because our oldest students now, our initial cohort of students are actually seniors. And so we um, are going to have the rubber hit the road and actually have the opportunity to distribute um, thousands of payments to seniors this year. And we're super excited to, to also evaluate the impact of that. And <clears throat> lastly, a key feature of this um, account is that you can view your balance online. So when you do send in that deposit or go into um, a branch, you can actually log in, view your balance, see those transactions. Um, and in fact, uh, we reward or incentivize um, that action. So if you register and create an online profile for the first time, we'll get you, we'll give you $20. And every year that you log in and view your balance, we'll give you $20 just by being engaged with that account. We want to reward and acknowledge that you're, you're participating and, and um, sparking that conversation with your student. 
Um, and if you have some questions, we'll, we'll make sure to take time at the end um, to answer all of those. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And you know, you heard me talk at, at length here, but just to kind of recap it quickly, the four ways. Um, I wish I had a, a way to do a pop quiz quickly, but um, one is to visit that local branch. Two is by mail, three is direct deposit, and fourth is bill pay. Um, and so we have some details there about what you would need to um, perform each of those actions. Like you'll need an ID when you go in um, to make a branch deposit. You'll want to write in your account number on the holidays, to, you know, almost like a stocking stuffer, if you will, or pass it out for a birthday if you want to give, you know, um, an account rather than buying a gift. That's one strategy some families use. Um, direct deposit, we have a downloadable form um, on to say your payroll department um, and they'll sign you up. It usually might take a pay, uh, one or two payment cycles for that to go into effect. And then, as I mentioned, bill pay is what you sign up for your bank on your bank side. Um, you can do that typically online and um, you can do it on a one off basis. So you don't have to commit to doing it, you know, with a set frequency. But if you're comfortable doing that, you could do it once a month, every two weeks, whatever is comfortable for you. Um, even small amounts really add up um, over time. And we'll go to the next slide. So some of the ways that you can um, earn the incentives and awards that we talked about include um, when we open an account for the first time, you can get a $20 bonus or um, award by making a deposit of any amount. So if you're a kindergartner, um, we're going to send you a welcome kit in the mail um, in November, and it's going to have your account number, and it's going to tell you to to you know, act quickly, make sure you make a deposit before the end of the school year. And if you deposit $1 or $20 or $100, whatever deposit amount you put into that account, just by taking that first action, we're going to give you 20 bucks. We offer everyone every year a $20 matching incentive. So if you put in $20, we'll match it $20. It's a dollar for dollar match up to 20 bucks. We have something called the growth incentive, which functions similar to interest. It's not, it's not interest technically, but based on the value of the contributions you've put in, you will get, um, you'll get a small amount awarded every month. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have this incentive that encourages you to log in, view your balance online, either for the first time when you're registering that account or once a year. And these incentives change every year simply because beyond that $50 seed that everyone gets, we fundraise additionally. So last year, we actually had a really big incentive that uh, awarded folks up to $100 by making a contribution. Um, if you made a contribution of any amount, you'd get $10 uh, up to 10 times. So we will do some creative um, things like that as well. And we have um, particularly an equity incentive. We can go to the next slide. That's really intentional for students in particular schools and neighborhoods. So in a moment, I'm going to drop in a link to some of the things I shared, the how to make a deposit brochure that we have. So you don't have to remember everything I said, um, and also our incentive flyer. Um, but now I'm going to kick it back to my colleague, Nicole, the OFE director, um, who's going to share with you some really exciting exciting resources as well. I think actually Mohana will oh, lean on you for Calcut. Sorry, <laughs> I made a mistake. Um, thank you. Um, so we have uh, some additional resources that are still college savings related. And the first one is with um, ScholarShare 529. So um, I see there is some questions or comments here in the chat that again, we'll get to in a moment at the end. Um, but to help share what a 529 is, um, 529 refers to the tax code that actually creates an exemption to have this type of an account that um, prov provides tax deferred growth or tax tax free growth on the amount that you put into this account. So as long as the funds that you contribute and then you withdraw are going to be intended for um, college education or post-secondary education for the beneficiary, um, the growth that accrues over time, because this is an investment vehicle, um, will not be taxed. And that's at both the federal and state level. Um, some states, um, because 529s are set up and sort of sanctioned by each state, um, even though it's it's underneath the federal tax code, there's a way um, 
with other states, if you if you happen to move or live elsewhere, that there's some additional benefits um, as well. But there's no there isn't a tax deduction. It's really about whatever money you put in the the growth over time um, being something that you're not going to have to pay taxes on. Um, and specifically here in California, um, we have, you know, our program kindergarten to college that's um, sanctioned by our local treasurer, Jose Cisneros. But then we have at the state level, the 529 scholarship program that's sponsored by the state treasurer. Um, and they have some really cool, exciting incentives. Um, for instance, if you're a lower income family that has an adjusted gross income of $75,000 or less, you might qualify for this $225 matching grant. Um, and there's um, also, particularly with our program, an opportunity if um, you want to save in both K to C and Scholarship 529 to contribute to our account, earn those incentives that we talked about, and then at some point, maybe when you have a balance of $500 or $1,000, you can choose to move that over to the 529 account at Scholarship. We do that really seamlessly. We can wire the funds over. Um, it's also an opportunity if your student ever leaves the district, um, San Francisco Unified, then we, you know, we can transfer not only the money you've put in, but those incentives over to a 529 so that you can grow that over time. Um, and there's not a silly question. So I see that from Aaron, but we'll, we'll make sure to get to it. Um, we'll go through the next slide. Um, and then you know, one really exciting um, initiative that just launched this year is what's called CalKids. Um, and so actually, Governor Newsom announced this. Um, and uh, Governor Newsom was was then mayor when K to C started. Um, so he actually attended our anniversary celebration recently and gave the preview about this really exciting um, announcement. And there's there's two parts to CalKids. One is an at birth initiative. Um, for newborns, every newborn after July 1st who's born in California is going to receive a CalKids account with $25. That's regardless of income, right? Every newborn. Um, the way that basically works for newborns is that um, about 90 days after the child is born, um, the the birth information is relayed to the California Department of Health, and then the state is able to um, actually send a notification in the mail that tells you about. Um, this account and how to view your balance online. And when you view your balance online or say connect it to a 529, you can um, start to earn more than that $25 really quickly and have you know, uh, up to $100. So you can get more than that, of course, but they have some incentives there that get you there really quickly. There's a second part of this that's for low income public school students throughout the state of California. And that gives you um, an award of $500 to $1,500. And there's two parts to that for school age children. So if your child was um, enrolled in public school last year, including you were a senior and graduated, but first to 12th grade as of last school year, they um, should receive um, by basically now or the end of the year, a letter in the mail that tells them whether they, they have $500 to $1,500. And that amount ranges based on whether or not um, they're low income, in which case they get at least 500. If they um, are also somebody who's been part of the foster care system, then they'll get another $500. And if they've experienced homelessness, then they'll get $500 additional. So that's how you can, you know, get at least 500 up to 1500 if you are considered a lower income public school student. And typically that would have been assessed um, through what's called the free and reduced lunch form um, that was typically collected um, by the district from families to, you know, it, you know, it, it allow for funding for a lot of different programs at the schools. And that um, that's how they will know if your student is low income or not. So that was because of COVID, there was an influx of money at the state level. Everyone, you know, in across grades that was low income got that um, and we'll hear about it. And if um, you, you know, your student just comes into the district or, or is coming into first grade every year moving forward, first graders are going to be able to get this as well. Um, and yeah, CalKids is very specific to California um, in that the funds have to be used, I believe, for an educational institution in California uh, of higher higher education. But um, 529 scholar share or K to C is not restricted in that way. We'll go to the next slide.
And now we're going to hear from my colleague um, to share more of those resources, and particularly maybe for some of you that have student loan debt or thinking about that. Um, so there's some really cool announcements. So Nicole, um, Mike is yours. Thanks so much, Mohan. And I'm going to switch gears just a bit here for a couple of slides to share some headlines around student debt relief for you all. Um, so the first program that I want to highlight is called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. This is a federal program, and it's designed to benefit public servants who work in government, nonprofit, or public education, and are paying down federal student loan debt. Um, so the program allows eligible borrowers uh, that have a, a balance to have the balance of their debt forgiven after working 10 years in public service and making 10 years worth of qualifying payments. We're a couple of days away from the end of a one year temporary waiver program in which the requirements around PSLF were made more permissive so that more people in the country would be able to qualify to receive debt forgiveness. Uh, so that temporary waiver period does end on October 31st of of this year, so just two days from now. If you're just hearing about this for the first time, I think two days is a bit of a tight turnaround to get all of the requirements fulfilled for submitting an application before the end of the waiver period. Uh, but that said, the link on this slide that I'm sharing now and this presentation will be shared with you afterwards, this link points to our website where we have another great webinar we've recorded that takes folks step by step through a guide of how to apply. Um, and I think it would be really useful if you think you might be eligible and you want to watch that and see if you think you can get all of those steps done in, in the next couple days. Um, so all of that said, I also want to reinforce that the end of the temporary waiver period on October 31st is not the end of the program. So once again, public service loan forgiveness as a program will continue after uh, the October 31st deadline. Um, and so if you're someone who works in public service and who has federal student loan debt, then this is absolutely a program that we want you to look into and make sure that you're aware of. And what you would do is essentially take steps annually to certify each year of your employment in public service as you work your way towards meeting that 10 year requirement. Um, so either way, our website is a great resource um, to take a look to see to learn more and see if you might qualify. Um, also, on the topic of student debt, I want to share a couple of announcements um, that have been in the news a lot frequently, so I'm sure you've heard as well. Um, so the first is that uh, all federal student loan debt repayment, um, which is currently paused, it's been in a status of forbearance since the start of the pandemic. Um, so the end of that payment pause uh, has been repeatedly pushed out during the pandemic. It's actually been pushed out eight separate times um, as the pandemic has lasted longer than all of us anticipated. And so I want to make sure to make everyone aware that's here that that um, final extension of the deadline will be the last one. And so our latest extension takes us through December 31st of 2022, so the end of this year. And um, at, after that date, so effective January 1st, 2023, uh, federal student loan debt will uh, begin, it will resume again in terms of repayments becoming due. And so just for everyone to be aware um, that repayments are coming down the line in, in January of 2023. And then finally, the second piece that I have here on the slide, which is the most exciting news, is uh, the Biden administration announced over this past summer that it will be forgiving student loan debt of up to $20,000 for eligible federal student loan borrowers. Uh, this particular program is a one-time measure. Uh, it's uh, approximately, it's estimated to support approximately 45 million Americans uh, that will receive either full or partial relief. So we're excited and we think this will be a real game changer for folks. Uh, in order to determine who is eligible, uh, the Department of Education is going to look at income from the years of 2020 or 2021, whichever one is lower, and they will provide that relief for individuals making up to $125,000 a year annually or households making up to $250,000 annually. 
And if you qualify with your income and you are a Pell Grant recipient, you'll be able to take advantage of the full $20,000 in student debt forgiveness. And if you were not a Pell Grant recipient, you will be given $10,000 in forgiveness. Um, a couple of things to note about this program are once again, that it's a one-time benefit. It, there is an application process to be able to take advantage of it. And that application will be available from now. It's, it's currently available all the way through December 31st of 2023. So we have just over a year for folks to apply um, to, to take advantage of this debt forgiveness. It is currently available online and we've taken a look at the application. It's, it's very fast. It takes about five minutes. I think you don't need to create a login or provide any kind of backup documentation with that initial application. You simply need to complete about five questions and then hit submit. Uh, I do wanna take a quick note. Um, I'm sure folks have seen in the news that there's been a court order around this program um, that per currently has the program paused. I want to clarify that despite the pause in the program, the application is still open. And so if you are eligible, you should definitely still apply for it. The Department of Education is still reviewing folks' applications, and essentially the court order um, temporarily prevents the administration from dispersing relief. And so they're, they're, they're teeing up everything up until the moment that they can disperse relief uh, and will begin dispersing relief as soon as the court order is resolved. Um, so the bottom line is definitely continue to apply if you're eligible. And then a final note I'll make on this is that if you're someone who qualifies for one-time debt relief and that debt relief would completely eliminate or cancel the rest of your debt, the Department of Education is really encouraging folks to apply soon. They've set a goal for themselves of having anyone who applies before this November 15th of 2022 um, that to process those applications so that in an ideal world, folks will never have to start repayment. So come that January 1st, 2023, beginning of repayments, the administration hopes to have those applications processed already so that you don't even have to get back into starting to repay and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so uh, these additional organizations that I've listed here, the Student Borrower Protection Center and the Student Debt Crisis Center are subject matter experts that our office really leans on for updates around um, this. And, and we sometimes partner with them to do webinars on uh, more extensive topics. So I would say I definitely encourage you to a link to their websites as well when you get this presentation if you want to learn more. And of course, you can always stay in touch with our office OFE um, for the general updates as they come as well. We'll be watching it too. And one last program I wanted to take a little bit more time. So I mentioned this at the top of the presentation, but really quickly want to take a moment to also plug our Smart Money Coaching program. As I mentioned, it's San Francisco's free financial coaching program. We provide services to anyone who lives, works, or receives services in the city, regardless of documentation status and in multiple languages. Um, the coaching is free, confidential, one-on-one uh, -on -one guidance that folks uh, really help to guide themselves. They make a plan with their coach. And you can see some of the things that we address there. And particularly if you perked up and thinking about um, some of the student debt issues, this is things that our coaches have been helping a lot of San Franciscans on this past year, uh, or just generally wanting to make a plan for savings and make a plan for saving for your kids' college. That's definitely something that we can talk to you about as well. And so uh, you can see it's as easy as calling the number on the slide or visiting us at our website to make an appointment. And uh, we highly encourage you to take advantage of the service. Um, so I'll pass it back to Mohan to finish out the presentation and then we're excited to dive into your questions. Thank you, Nicole. And um, sorry, I was sharing some links, so I just dropped in the couple correct links there. So uh, we'll make sure that you have them for both uh, debt forgiveness generally and uh, public service loan forgiveness. Um, we shared the uh, smart money coaching one, but we'll reshare it as well in a moment. 
Um, and just wanted to wrap up with some of our contact information and um, first to share some of the testimonials we have. One of the cool things we have with kindergarten to college um, is also besides those incentives, we have different um, uh, art and poetry contests. We have a summer virtual college tour. Um, we get to collect a lot of our students' stories and that's what's really powerful, um, I think, in um, being able to do this work. So here we hear um, from one student who says, uh, in the future, I want to attend a better university and be successful. Saving money for college can help me to have a sufficient financial support to accomplish my future college dreams. Um, we'll go to the next slide, and we have more of those testimonials on the K2C site. So to stay connected um, with the next slide, there's a few ways. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We also have a page um, that uh, posts a lot of that same content in Spanish. So you can follow us at K2C SF. Our website again is k2csf.org um, and that's the same for our social media handles except the Spanish version is k2c latino um, and with our next slide um, you can see some of our tutorial videos we have these in multiple languages um, uh, English and Spanish we have one in Canada that overviews um, what KDC is, how to register and view your balance online, um, how to log into your account, all of those things we can help walk you through. Um, and we also have a newsletter in multiple languages that you can sign up for where we promote and advertise workshops and some of those contests that I mentioned. Um, with our last slide or two, um, Finally, I mentioned our website, but just to plug it again, k2csf.org and our general email. Um, if you have uh, an inquiry where you want to really talk to someone on the phone, you can call 311 in San Francisco um, by selecting the treasurer's office and tax collector. You'll be able to get routed and, and you know, ask your question about KDC. Um, so I see I saw some questions, for instance, in the chat that we'll, we'll address more directly about like, does my student have an account or um, that kind of question? You can go to our site and we actually have a lookup feature where you can type in your student's name and zip code and date of birth. You'll be able to get their account number. If that doesn't work, you could call us at 311 in San Francisco or that 415 number and provide your students info and we'll make sure to follow up with you and give you a ring um, and walk you through any additional questions that you have. Um, so want to thank you again and uh, wanted to allow for at least, you know, 15 minutes or so of questions. Um, and maybe we could just start from the top. Um, and <clears throat> so I'll maybe go with the first one I had seen, um, just refreshing my memory. Um, and so the question from Jenny is, in the future, when the child applies for college, will this be an account considered as part of their assets? Will it affect how much you get from FAFSA? Um, and so I can answer that question somewhat from the perspective of K to C. I think um, CalKids is a brand new initiative that you'll want to um, you know, get some more guidance perhaps from them directly on or from a certified financial planner. Um, my answer is a bit admittedly of a non-answer in that the FAFSA so application will, will change every year and have different guidance or rules about what you want to disclose or not. Generally, this is, again, not formal advice from a financial planner. I'm not a financial planner or a tax attorney or expert on financial aid, is that since this account, the kindergarten to college account, is technically owned by the city and county of San Francisco, there's likely not a need to disclose the, the balance that's there when you apply. But if you receive the funds after, say, you know, the start of that school year and when you reapply, there might be a need to disclose whatever money, scholarships or otherwise that you've received. Um, the funds in that account are, are not, you know, wouldn't be seen as income, I'm pretty sure, because the money that's been put in presumably has already been taxed. Um, and the incentives that we offer are a kind of scholarship. Um, so, you know, I think the best thing is when you get to that point um, to really evaluate you know, what, what is the best advice based on how they ask the question for FAFSA, for, you know, a college's financial aid application, and see how to answer it truthfully and in the best way. Um, generally, though, as we know, a lot of financial aid, um, you know, ultimately can be loans. And so um, I think there there is a benefit to saving early, um, both for that college going mindset that we talked about, but having some money that can provide a lot more flexibility than just loans themselves. Um, I see another question that came in about, um, you know, a really financial planning question about having maybe decided 
um, to move away from saving in a 529 and put that money into a Roth. Um, I don't know if we have any financial planners that can jump into that question, but I think we have some resources at least that like connect you to someone to help think about that strategy over time in terms of the growth that could happen or um, tax implications. Um, personally, I'm aware of, yeah, the benefits of kind of saving in a Roth for a variety of purposes to have flexibility in, in taking money out later. Um, I wouldn't be able to say if it's it's absolutely better. I think with all of these, these things, trade-offs, and the question I always pose from a financial coaching point of view is what's best for you? Um, what's going to be best considering the tax implications and trying to research that as best as you can? What are the benefits of that growth over time? So admittedly, K to C is not an investment vehicle, just to speak more definitively, you know, compared to a 529. But you can have that practice of having a student go in and contribute their own money, save up a little bit. Um, at some point, you might want the benefits of a 529 where you can, you know, select an investment choice that says, uh, my student's going to graduate in 2025. And that helps you manage risk over time and adjust the portfolio so that as they near graduation, it's in more conservative investments that mean that, you know, it's less likely to just, you know, uh, take a dip. But for some people, they they may want to just put money in an, an account where there's no risk of that money being lost, um, or they want more flexibility. So it's not just college savings, which a 529 is for. So I think you're you're sharing some really interesting strategies, Jay, um, that all of us could consider. Um, and then Mohan, for Aaron, would you like me? Would you like me yeah, to uh, just weigh in on that? Well, I'm I'm not going to say much more than what you did, but uh, from a financial planning standpoint. It does depend. It depends on your particular situation. But a good rule of thumb when you're thinking about investments and in a Roth IRA, uh, you would be thinking about investing that money because it's a, if you use it for retirement, that's usually a longer term goal. Um, so a, a good rule of thumb that I use uh, just to remind my clients is, is if your time horizon is greater than 10 years away, Yes, potentially you can be in investing in the stock and the bond market. So you can do that by saving in a 529, getting into uh, the passive uh, glide path for your, your child or your student. Um, that's fine. Uh, or you could save in a Roth IRA and then potentially withdraw those funds tax-free in the future. Um, and when I say funds, it would be your contributions. So the the Roth IRA uh, is going to be a little bit more complicated because, of course, there are uh, certain triggers that you need to be aware of, not withdrawing earnings, uh, depending on whose Roth it is. There, there's just a lot more complications there. So if you want to keep it simple, uh, having um, the kindergarten to college or the or the Cal kids is really awesome, but you're not going to get a lot of growth uh, necessarily in that money, but you won't see downturns either. So uh, yes, it does depend on your individual situation and you want to be prudent about where you put money at risk. Back to you, Mohan. Thank you um, for that expertise. And I see just a couple of K to C maybe related questions that I want to address before we can get to um, the final few minutes with student loans. So um, one question was, um, again, not silly, um, you know, is, is this program available to students outside of San Francisco or in another county? So K to C is really specific to students that are enrolled in San Francisco Unified School District. And if you happen to move or leave the school district, there's ways that we can move that balance over to a 529 at scholar share. Um, if you live in another county like Alameda County, um, they actually have some similar college savings initiatives, um, both something that's at birth and something for school age children. And um, as we mentioned as well, CalKids is a statewide initiative that's super exciting, both for newborns and school age children. Um, so I'm going to drop in a couple of links to those, and you're you're welcome to message me directly if you know yeah you know, if you know where you live, and I can try to think of what I know offhand if there's a, a related local college savings initiative. Um, and then the other question I saw is like, well, my my students might be homeschooled, or are they part of this? There are some homeschool students, uh, particularly if they have a, a disability. There's a certain program I'm forgetting the the name of where they might be technically affiliated with the district. Um, so again, I would recommend going to our site and using that lookup feature with the students um, information. If they don't pop up with an account number, you could still call 311. 
Um, we'll uh, go to Nicole to just maybe answer the couple of questions that may have come in about student debt. Sure. So I'm seeing a question from Teresa, who is just going to be starting her work soon in public service with the VA. Teresa, that's fantastic. Congratulations on your new role. Um, public service loan forgiveness is definitely something that you should look into if you continue your service either in that government role with nonprofit or in public education for the next 10 years. Um, you asked a question about why this temporary waiver period has been more permissive. Um, the way in which it's been more permissive is really for folks who have already been working in public service um, and have basically have their years of service but have found at the end of that trajectory that they were unable for one reason or another to take advantage of the program. So to speak in a little bit more depth about it, there's actually four criteria for taking advantage of PSLF. You, of course, must have 10 years of employment in public service and have made 120 qualifying payments toward your student loan debt during that time, so during those 10 years. Uh, but in addition to that, you need to have a specific loan type of direct loans, and you need to be in a specific type of repayment plan, an income-driven repayment plan. And so many folks uh, didn't have the full details on all of this eligibility criteria, worked very hard for 10 years of service, and then found at the end of those 10 years to their huge disappointment that either they had a different type of loan, not direct loans, or they were in an incorrect repayment plan and had the heartbreaking experience of being rejected after so many years of service. And so essentially the temporary waiver period was an initiative undertaken by the Biden administration to, to fix and true up those past issues by um, for a one year period, this temporary waiver period, it allowed folks who otherwise had the years of service to be able to retroactively go back, consolidate their loans into direct loans, um, and it removed the requirement for being in an income driven repayment plan. And so allowed folks that otherwise would have qualified but weren't able to check every box to be able during this temporary period to um, apply and be able to receive a credit for their years of service. Um, so as I mentioned in the presentation, we're coming to the end of that temporary period on the 31st. So in just a couple days from now, but um, it since you're just on the beginning of your public service journey, Teresa, I think you'll be in really good shape definitely take a look at our website so you can understand more about those specific criteria but i think you're in great shape for um, having all of the criteria in place uh, at the start of your public service employment to be able to take advantage of the program after your 10 years of service um let me see i'm um i see a question from ya uh around tax taxation at the California, so the state level um, for debt forgiveness. And so to my knowledge uh, at the state level, uh, the one-time debt forgiveness that the Biden administration is um, currently has is currently taxable in, in the state of California. At the federal level, it is not taxable. Um, PSLF, I, I don't believe is taxable at the state level, uh, but the one-time forgiveness that the Biden administration has currently up to $20,000 is currently taxable. Um, that said, it's well on the radar of our California legislators, and we're hoping that they will uh, make a fix so that it is not um, considered taxable. But as of current law, as of today, uh, it is taxable. So um, unfortunately, but thank you for raising that. And thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, I see maybe one last question or two that relates to just like, should I save if my student's a junior and I see some good like even discussion in the chat and I would just say yes, with K to C or otherwise, um, every little bit counts, um, you know, even 100 bucks you can get to really quickly by putting in $20 of your own money viewing the balance online, but also with something like a 529 because let's say, you know, your student's going to go uh, be a, a freshman, um, you know, next year or in a couple of years, um, they could still use the money in a 529 for graduate school. Um, you can also switch who the beneficiary is. If say one student decides they don't want to go to school or higher education, you can you can designate somebody else. So 
you know, don't let that be a reason. I think we all we can all have reasons why we may not think that it's worth it. And there's conservative options as well that you can choose as um, those investment choices, particularly with the 529. Great. Well, thank you, Mohan. And I, I just once again, in our, our last uh, seconds together, want to give a big thank you to everyone who's joined us and for your fantastic questions and engaging conversation in the chat. Um, we encourage you to take a look at OFE's website and K2C's website as an ongoing resource for you. Um, and feel free to reach out to us if there's anything we can do to answer your questions or, you know, if you'd like to see more focus in a specific area where, where we can um, help. And so with that, we'll we'll bid you guys adieu to the 345 session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole and Mohan. Excellent.